Welcome back to yet another volume of disturbing tales taken from Reddit. For today's episode, we're going to narrate three new stories from the platform. Sit back with your snacks and prepare to enjoy. If you're taking part in our 100th episode giveaway, remember that your entry is not complete after posting a single comment. If you need to refresh your memory on how to win our prize, please be sure to check out the rules stated in our volume 100 video. Find the link on screen now. I wish the best of luck to each viewer that takes the time to support the channel, and it'll be my honor to gift this prize when the time comes. Until then, let's jump into these unsettling stories. This story has always bothered me. In my head, I know what I saw, but at the same time, it just felt all so unreal. When I was around 10 years old, I had been invited to a sleepover for the first time at my friend's house. This friend, whom I'll call Abby, lived pretty far away from us, so anytime we got to hang out, it felt like a special occasion. I had just started becoming brave enough to sleep away from my parents, and because she was one of my oldest friends, Abby's house was going to be one of these trial run sleepovers. A little about Abby's family. She's the youngest of four kids. Her oldest brother, who is about 10 years older than us, has pretty severe autism and continues to live full time with Abby's parents. He was always a bit of a wild card, and I, as a 10 year old girl, always felt just a little anxious around him. Anyway, there are three of us girls at the slumber party. We decided to sleep on the main floor of her house so that we could stay up late watching movies that would eventually lull us to sleep. I had chosen the couch that was perpendicular to the wall of windows, looking out onto Abby's deck and backyard. The other girls had set up on the floor, on a mattress together. We throw in a DVD, and we all quickly fall asleep. Sleeping away from home has never been easy for me. I wake up frequently, and sometimes I can't fall asleep at all to begin with. This night was one of those times where, after clocking a solid two hours, Something stirred me back to consciousness. Coming to, I noticed the bright light of the TV glowing first before my eyes adjusted and noticed something outside that hadn't been there before. It was a person. A man, actually. He was sitting in one of the deck chairs and he'd positioned it to face directly towards where the three of us were sleeping. He hadn't noticed that I was awake, but seeing him made my heart race. I stayed absolutely still, just watching. It was dark, and so his features were a bit ambiguous, but I could tell that he was studying us and smirking. Terrified, I watched him for a few minutes before turning myself into the couch cushion and closing my eyes. Some time passed, maybe a few minutes, maybe half an hour, before I finally mustered up the courage to look again only to see that he was now gone. To this day, I have no idea who it was that had gotten into Abby's backyard and sat on our deck watching us in the middle of the night. But the image of him sitting there, grinning, still haunts me. For a while, I thought it may have been her brother or her father, but this guy had dark hair and even darker eyes, and all her family members were blonde. We all survived the night unharmed, but as I recounted what I had seen to my friends and Abby's parents, I was met with quizzical looks and reassurances that I had probably not seen what I thought I saw. That's the story of the first and last time that I ever spent the night at Abby's house. In my younger days, I had a church acquaintance who we'll call Matthew for the sake of this story. He was popular, funny, charismatic, and attractive. I myself had once been interested in him, but by this point I knew better. He was flirty with everyone, and I wasn't into being one of the many. We were all back in town for a break over a holiday from school. It was cold, and we ended up at a rental house near downtown in a rather sketchy neighborhood. The party itself wasn't terribly memorable, 
My best friend, Faith, had ended up in Matthew's lap, some kissing, but still out in a main room. Both of them had appeared to drink too much, so at this point, we decided that we were going home. Faith had already had some very bad stuff happen to her while drinking, so I was getting a bit concerned when I saw her so drunk. Matthew, I thought, was helping me walk her out to my car when he offered to give her a ride home because she lived closer to him. I told him no, I would take her home. He stopped his march in the middle of the street, holding onto her arm, damn near tugging her away from me. It was obvious that he wanted to take her. I held her other arm for dear life. Again, I directly told him that I'd be taking her home. I made a pretty firm declaration that she came with me and she wouldn't be leaving without me. And this is when things got weirder. Matthew's face twisted and contorted as he went through every human emotion trying to convince me to let him take her. From trying to peer pressure me, begging with tears in his eyes, to downright anger, pulling with each approach. If I hadn't seen it, I don't know that I would have believed a person could be so fake, but it weirded me out to no end and reinforced that there was something very, very off about him. I think we stood in the road arguing over her for five to ten minutes. Once he had given it all he had, he abruptly gave up and I hustled to get her in my car and far, far away from him. I dropped her off as planned, drove home myself just a bit shaken, but it did bring to mind all of the other crazy things that he had previously stated he had done, from being unkind to animals, to whispering extremely inappropriate things in our ears and others' ears during church to get us to react. He had started fires and the list just goes on and on. His mom escaped his abusive biological father and changed their last names. But the real kicker for me was when I found out he was pursuing an occupation in medicine that pretty much controls if you live or die in surgery. To say I was disturbed, probably a huge understatement. The next day, I checked in with my friend to ask if she remembered what he did that night or how things felt to her. She vaguely remembered a struggle, but that was all. The alcohol had erased a lot of it. I ended up moving across the country and so did Matthew, so I didn't have to be in any contact with him. I warned all my friends because they still ran into him from time to time during the holidays. I wish I could have warned the world though. At the time, the cycling through every single emotion for minutes on a freezing night, trying to get my practically passed out friend into his car to do whatever he wanted. It felt chilling and evil, and to this day, it's one creepy encounter that I won't ever soon forget. I now have a lot of distance from the situation, so I finally feel comfortable posting about it. When I lived in Boulder, Colorado, I was living in a motel-style, off-campus apartment building. It was mostly students living there, and I was on the first floor. Standard layout for a small studio apartment. There was a kitchenette, a dining nook, and there was one large window. The window was actually above my bed, just for a little context. There were many signs that I had a stalker watching me for months before I fully realized the situation that I was in. It started with a few stolen packages here and there. A disposable camera stolen from my car, a random movie poster left in my car that absolutely none of my friends had ever seen before, and most notably, a man in a bright orange hoodie with his hood up, walking back and forth past my living room window, maybe 20 times in one day. I was on the phone with my boyfriend when I first noticed him. I made a comment about it, but I figured that I was overreacting. Two months after I first noticed him, my boyfriend happened to be out of town with his family on a trip, so I was watching his dog for him. I woke up earlier than normal to go walk her, maybe around 6 a.m. Afterwards, I laid in bed on my phone. At one point around 6.30, I looked up from my phone, and the same man in the same bright orange hoodie 
was standing right over my bed, looking at me through the window. We were basically a foot apart, the wall and the window being the only things between us. I was frozen in shock, and he didn't leave. He continued to stare at me for about 30 seconds, and then simply walked off. I immediately hid under my bed and phoned the police. I put two and two together and realized all of these coincidences probably weren't coincidences, and he may have been coming by to watch me sleep every morning, and possibly every night, for months. This was the first time I acknowledged him, and he seemed excited by it. The police told me to close all my blinds and to get a camera. Thanks for the help, I guess. They said this was common in Boulder, considering both the high student and high homeless population. The man didn't look homeless, though. He also didn't fit the description of anyone who lived in my building. The police officers had checked with my building manager. So that meant he was coming from somewhere else, specifically just to watch me sleep. I did as I was told, closed all my blinds, but about two hours after the police officers left, he came back and banged on my window after trying to open my door, which was always automatically locked. I was terrified. I called the police again and left town to go be with my boyfriend and his family for the next few days. When I got back, I never planned to stay at my apartment alone at night, but I figured I could unpack my things as it had been a few days, and he probably noticed that I was gone. Within the hour of me being back, so was he, and this time, he held up a camera through the one crack in my blinds that I had, and he also held up a knife behind the camera, slowly walking by, making sure that I saw. Oh, I saw all right. I called the police for a third and final time. They made an official police report, and I moved out of my apartment within the week. I never saw that man again, but from time to time, I did check my old apartment's reviews on Google because they tried to charge me $1,800 to leave while knowing about the situation, which I thought was absolutely insane. Colorado laws protect stalking victims from these fees, though, so big middle finger to my property managers. Anyway, I checked recently, considering what the Idaho killer had been up to and how much it reminded me of my own situation. I saw a review about a man chasing girls around with a knife and the building doing absolutely nothing about it. It was from a parent and I reached out to her personally on Facebook. The same man in the bright orange hoodie had attacked her daughter in the parking lot at 4 a.m. with a knife. He tried to stab her as she was getting into her car, stabbed her car when he failed to get her, and tried to slash her tires as she began to escape. In case you're wondering, he's still out there.